the platform is looking at how to position itself in a changing global aid architecture. And your team there at GFA Global Foresight Hub has been commissioned by the platform to develop different prospects for agriculture and rural development assistance in the post-2015 development framework. You looked at different scenarios, which we cannot capture in their entire complexity here, obviously. But there are a number of trends and ruptures that you identified. What is the main one of importance? Maybe first, just to be clear, those scenarios are somehow the contextual backgrounds under which the, the um, development aid might have to develop in the future. So it was important to identify these backgrounds because the, the global world order will obviously influence the type of development assistance that could take place in the future. So in terms of trends and ruptures, I would say um, the way we, we look at uh, the, the challenge that we have to face is probably um, the, 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 key, the key trend. We are considering right now that whatever problems we will have to face in the future, uh, we will always have the capacity to solve it. And therefore, we do not have a very much anticipatory, uh, preactive approach against, against the, the issues of, of development that we will have to face in the future. We believe very much that we will be able to face them whatever they are. You also spoke about major uncertainties for the post-2015 for the world. Um, what do you think is the main uncertainty that should concern us? We talked about major uncertainties because all these are interconnected. So it would be difficult to highlight one, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, what might happen with clean climate change or, or uh, social uh, uh, transformations. Uh, technological breakthroughs, all these things are interconnected. So I would say um, the major uncertainty, no, sorry, the way we deal with, the ma with those major uncertainties is the key challenge, not, not each one individual. If you want to win a war against climate change, you would have to throw your resources in one direction. You would have to make a strategic decision. So I'm trying to get that from you a little bit here. Where, where would you think you should put your resources and then all the interconnected things will follow and we'll see what comes. This is a tricky question. If we had answer to that question, I think we would have already solved the problem. Uh, I think the whole thing uh, lies from, uh, in, in the willingness that we, we, we have in, in, for, for changing the things that we know need to be changed. And that, that comes from the behavior of people. Um, we have three basic fundamental powers at work in the world. One is um, the economic power. The second one is the political power, and the third one is probably uh, the power of people, the stakeholders' power. And I think that uh, if we want to handle or tackle one uncertainty, such as the climate change, um, we need to have a, conjunct a conjunction of actions and, and, and a synergy uh, between those three powers in order to work, in, in order to, to address collectively this kind of uncertainty. So um, the tricky point is, where do we start from in order to make this happen? You also speak about that shocks have become a main driver for change. You can explain that briefly a little bit and why was that not the case before? I think it was the case before, but we did not realize that very much because shocks were not so unpredictable and they were not so frequent and they were not so systemic, if I can say that. I mean, uh, the technological, the industrial revolution was a, base, was a fundamental shock at the beginning of the 20th century and it has completely changed the face of the world. It was unpredictable uh, to some extent and had some systemic effect, but it was one major shock. Now we are facing uh, with uh, let's say, a, a, a series of recurrent, uh, complex, systemic, interconnected shocks which are linked with biological issues, with economic issues, uh, the, the energy problem, um, societal concerns about inequities. Uh, all those things work together and, and contribute to make this, this, unique, this world more, more unpredictable. Um, and, and for that, we really need now to, to be prepared. The whole concept of being victim to shocks and change, therefore, is, is a very um, somewhat negative view that, that we are just sort of played with, you know, and uh, we, we cannot really do much about it. We just adjust, you know, we mitigate and so forth. So it seems to imply that we can't do anything about change. change. Uh, are we just played with? What, what's your opinion on that? 
No, to some extent, of course, we consider ourselves as, as victims, but we are also, if I can say that, the, the perpetrators of, of most of these shocks, if, if the word exists in English, I'm not sure. Um, um, but uh, the idea is that most of these shocks now are, are caused by human agency, and so we, we have a capacity to at least uh, reduce our, our, our impact on the frequency, the, the, the unpredictability of those shots. We have created dynamics and inertia which will have now a long-term effect like on the climate change, for example, but it doesn't mean that we are powerless uh, to fix them or, or at least to work on them. I think we're getting into a subject there where Nassim Nicholas Taleb uh, in his bestseller, The Black Swan, he described as extremist power, which is a situation we find our world in today with previously unthinkable extremes in all sorts of areas and ways, with superstars getting super rich, uh, not just environmental shocks that haven't been like that. And he has a new book where he uh, talks about the anti-fragile, you know, the uh, uh, sort of a robustness on a much higher level, which allows for certain shocks to happen to be, to be anti-fragile overall. Um, so he speaks of ways to make ourselves more robust or anti-fragile to those extremes. And which one of your conclusions, and I can show now the your chart if you want, could work towards making us more robust to extremes? I would say the five conclusions have to be dealt with together in an interconnected way. Highlighting one of them would be somehow believing that there is a single or a, sim a simpler answer to, to, uh, to being robust and, and resilient. Actually, here the idea was uh, first um, to make sure that we are addressing the right problem, which is the, the, the situation of food insecure people. Um, while right now at the world level, we are talking much more about food security, but really what matters right now is, is what might happen to those people who are still food insecure right now and, and who will be food insecure in the future. And that related to the mandates of uh, the, the Global Donor Platform on Rural Development also uh, needs to address to be addressed through who will be the farmers in the future. We, we have also concluded that the, in, in order to make this happening, I mean, the, the revitalization of rural areas, for example, uh, it's the, the key drivers for that would be uh, policies and societal values behind uh, the idea of, of, of having more thriving uh, rural areas. And, and uh, for that, at, at the level of what kind of options can be, can be implemented, uh, we are highlighting alternatives to technology-based farm productivity, which means considering that a rural area and agriculture in a rural area is not just a productivity-based uh, approach of, of, of livelihood. It's, it's, it's a more uh, systemic, comprehensive approach of what, why we, we need a rural areas to be, to be developed and not just having urbanization and, and, and everybody living in, in, urban, uh, in urban areas. So the, the whole issue there is to explore the diversity and to take into consideration the local dimensions of, of, of development and the local dimensions of food insecurity. So back to your questions. The, those five points have to be addressed simultaneously because they are interconnected. I understand that your team doesn't do predictions. Um, so I won't ask you which scenario you would think of as the most likely to happen. But uh, please pick one for us that you think would enlighten our thinking most and would encourage political change best. We are mostly faced with attempts uh, of organizational development, as if this would bring anything about. But it's probably more about political change. I would say probably the, the most relevant scenario is, is the value change scenario. So the value change uh, scenario, actually it's interesting to highlight it because it's more or less the, the, the framework uh, which is implicitly used uh, in the current post-2015 uh, uh, talks about the, the development agenda. Uh, but it is not the scenario that is currently happening as a global world order. So um, it's interesting to see that there is a disconnect between the values that are implicitly embedded in the current discussion on the post-2015 development agenda and the current scenario, which is more like more um, the market forces scenario that we can see on the on the lower uh, uh, left quadrant of, of this graph. Um, so why would I, I highlight the value change? It's because it shows um, somehow 
that in order to make it operational, all these ideas, all these discourse, all the discourse that we have on development in, for the post-2015 agenda, we need more than, than, than just having some kind of indicators. We need to have a change in the value, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in the relations, in the power relationship between uh, the economic sector, the political sector, and let's say the, the sector represented by, by the civil society organizations and, and, and other stakeholders. In your presentation to the platform board in October, you mentioned something that looks as if you identified a possible fixation by many ARD donors on supporting smallholders in a very narrow sense, meaning only looking at agriculture-related inroads and achieving development in that way. You agreed that you argued that many small smallholders had family income practices that made them more resilient to commodity price or environmental shocks by diversifying their family income basis in form of having a family member generating income outside of agriculture. So donor support should not push only into the direction of agriculture, but also include these aspects. Please explain that. The question that was asked to us and in, in this study was to think about um, the future of development assistance uh, related to agriculture and rural development. And agriculture and rural development are at the core of, the, of, the, of this work. So the question was how in the future might agriculture relate with rural development? And the idea here is that it's the concept of having agriculture in rural development which, which matters. Um, the, the, the belief that the future of a rural area is, is conditioned or, or determined only by the capacity of uh, farmers to produce more and more efficiently is not a systemic approach of, of the problems that those people are facing and the problems of food insecurity and, and nutrition insecurity. Um, you, you may not just want to have rural areas that are uh, the places where we produce food full stop. That's, that's the idea. Um, and, and, and that leads to, to questioning the transformation of those rural areas. Is agriculture the only vector? The, the answer probably is not, and, and, and the donors know that. But it's, it's easy to invest in agriculture because this is where um, you may find uh, most, uh, mostly uh, immediate answers to, inv to, to investments with higher productivity, better yields, etc. But the long-term um, improvement of the welfare of the people, especially those who are living in marginalized remote areas, will require more than, than productivity increase and, and agricultural activities. So the, the argument that we had was that small orders are, produce, are, are providing a huge uh, source of employment in rural areas, but they can't be just the only one doing this, and they need to uh, be incorporated in, in, in infrastructure development, but also other activities from the, from the secondary and the tertiary sectors, so that rural areas become places where it is, it is pleasant to live, not just uh, comfortable to produce. The linkages between the urban area have to be reconsidered in, in the approaches of the donors. How that could be done? I mean, obviously, program design needs to be more holistic and look into long-term sustainability without going into these buzzwords where everybody zooms out, I suppose. What would your your suggestion be for program design? That probably will require a different approach from the development assistance intervention uh, side. Um, we, we are, in, in, in the study that we are conducting for, for you right now, we are now on, on, a, on a way of thinking which is about building coalitions of interventions rather than having donors intervening with their own uh, focus in, their, in some specific domains or specific regions. Um, and, and that coalition building is, is a call that is more generic. It's not just for development assistance. Um, and that would probably need also to incorporate other actors uh, who can play an important role in development, not necessarily in development assistance, huh? but in development by combining actions where you will have both public and private funds um, investing in, in the development of these areas, uh, strengthening the capacity of the people, making their livelihoods, making their environment much more uh, attractive. 
So yeah, I think it's, it's, it needs, we need to reconsider to what extent um, the current way interventions are, are, are designed um, will have to be, how, how, the, how that will have to be modified. And probably one, one, one pathway for that is to reconsider, for example, platforms like the GDPR, the roles in the future um, as, as a means maybe not only to coordinate individual members' actions, but to engage them in collective action within the platform as members, but also with outside uh, uh, actors of, of development, including, as I said, the business uh, sector, but also policymakers, local organizations, and make those things focused on very specific locally based approaches where the main problem of food insecurity are, are concentrated right now, and we know where those, those places are. Thank you very much. Thank you to you.